Okay, I guess without further ado, let's start. So this is advanced data analysis presented by Outreach Committee and our great friends from the SLB. So um, first we're gonna do some introductions. So just to start, um, just say for all the SLB members, just say your name, your grade and your project category. So hi everyone, I'm Jesse. I'm a senior and then my project category is biochemistry. Um, hi, <clears throat> yeah, uh, hi. my name is Eleanor. I am a sophomore and uh, my project category is biochemistry. Okay, Andrew, could you, could you go? Hello. Hi everyone, I'm Andrew. I am a junior at Canyon Crest Academy and my project is uh, bioinformatics slash uh, health sciences. All right, Emily. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm a senior and my category is environmental engineering. Okay. So some general PSAs, public service announcements. Um, just a reminder, safety screening deadline is December 31st. Please make sure if you haven't already done that, please submit your safety screening on a website. It's very quick and fast. Um, if you have any questions about forms, please go to our, our YouTube channel. We go over all of that or ask us in our breakout room. Um, you have to apply for a safety screening. Uh, if you don't make safety screening, you can't come to the fair this year. So please do that. Um, and all the fair updates for this March are on the website, including like explaining how we're generally going to do a virtual fair, although uh, we're still ironing out the details. So please uh, look on the website and um, I guess look on social media for that. Um, you can follow us on our social media who've been working. They've been working really hard. We post very fun things um, and also updates and when our next workshops are coming. So uh, it would be a good idea to follow that. <laughs> and lastly, our YouTube channel, we've been working pretty hard on initiating that this year. We've been doing a lot of videos on how to apply for pre-screening um, and also workshop replays, like I was saying earlier. So um, please follow that as well. Okay, so today, um, go ahead, Emily. All right, so today we're gonna talk about data analysis um, and different types of data analysis. Uh, next slide. Okay, first let's talk about uh, and review the basics of analyzing your data. So make sure you organize your data into charts and then graph them in order to see the correlation between variables. Observe your graphs and calculate some statistical results. And finally, discuss the differences and the meaning of your statistical analysis. So ultimately, your data should be answering a question about a problem. It should be related to your problem statement, and it should either support or not support your hypothesis. One note is that sometimes you can be fooled by only looking at raw data, and you might make an incorrect assumption that the data does or does not support your hypothesis. So make sure you carefully follow the steps for graphing and interpretation, or else you might miss important information and new ideas suggested by your data. Next slide, please. Um, some more reminders about organization. So you can organize your numerica data into tables like in Excel and Google Sheets so that they're easily graphable. Qualitative data such as photos and observations should also be kept neatly. Make sure you save all of your data, even pre-trials, even if you think it's not going to be useful because you might want it later. You might come back to it and make some interesting suggestions in your discussion reasoning behind your experiment or for future work. And all of your data should go into the appendix of your scientific notebook. Next slide, please. So it can be really confusing if there's a ton of data analyses methods, what do you use and when? So just remember that not everything that we present today will be relevant to everyone's project. We pulled you all and the SLB to see which were the most important analyses that are most commonly used in science fair projects. But if you don't use the right type of analyses, it can hurt you or if you use them wrongly. So we recommend that you depend on your literature search and use the same analysis as other people with similar projects in your field. Or you can ask us a specific question and we can tell you the appropriate analysis for the data types you have to use. Um, but at the end of the day, don't just plug and chug. Science is about understanding the math and data, so you should be able to explain why you're using a certain analysis and what it means in the context of your experiment. Next 
Right. So um, I guess that's what we're going over next. Uh, analyses and what to use when. So when generating and plotting data, you're either plotting the points you measured directly or you're plotting a mean value for different conditions. The data points you directly plot are always associated with an error. And depending on the machinery or method you use, you may or may not know what value that is. So for example, a standard ruler only has markings to a millimeter. And if you're measuring in centimeters, your error would be half the precision, which would be half a millimeter or 0.05 centimeters. So when you plot this, your error bars would be 0.05 centimeters above and below your measurement. On the other hand, if you're plotting averages, you often want to show the distribution of points you averaged. So you know how precise your data is or how well the points agree on a value. So if you can use a standard deviation, which you can calculate in Excel or sheets or even by hand, all of your plots in that condition and plot it as an error bar with your average. So you know if the average represents your data well and if its distribution overlaps with any other conditions. In addition to error bars for your average values, another way to show data distribution is with box and Worcester plots, which is basically a five value summary of your data. It shows your minimum and maximum value, median, and where the quartiles, which are the 25% and 75% marks of your data are. And the length and distribution of your plots can tell you where most of your data points are, and if the highest and lowest values are outliers, which don't represent your data. So if you look in the second plot, the box is relatively smaller than the total length, and it's placed toward the lower value, which is where the majority of the data points are. Now let's say that you have one variable that differs over time and it's in a scatter plot, like when you have a plant growth grow over one week. You can ask if there's a linear relationship between plant growth and time and perhaps you wanna know how tall the plant will grow in two weeks. You can use a line of best fit to make a prediction for your growth over time. In this case, you would ask if the X variable or the time in days increases, does the Y variable or the plant growth also increase? And this is a positive correlation as denoted from the positive slope of the line. On the other hand, you could also ask if they were two inversely, if these two were inversely correlated, where if X decreases, does Y increase? The intuition behind this line of best fit is that you basically are trying to minimize the distance from each data point to the predicted line. Later, we'll talk about how to use statistical tests to quantify how well the line of best fit represents the data. The first statistical test we have is R-squared, also known as the coefficient or determination. It's a value that tells you how well your model or line represents the variance of your data. Basically, how well does your line fit, line fit the scatter plot? Higher R-squared means a better fit with less error or deviations from the line. In the figure, you can see that an R-squared of 100% or one is perfectly on the line. And as the points grow more random in distance, the R-squared decreases. If you use linear regression or any type of regression, such as fitting exponential graphs or logarithmic graphs, you should use an R-squared value to validate and quantify how well your model is doing. And if you can really make a statement about the correlation between the independent and dependent variable. Hi, so now I'm gonna go over some common statistical tests that people would use on their science fair projects. Next slide, please. So what is a statistical test? Well, this is it's just what it sounds like. It's a test to deem if your results are statistically significant. So for example, are you actually seeing a trend in the growth of your plant versus time or is it random? Um, so is your data real or is it just noise generated by like random chance? Uh, like on that day, the plant just happened to grow this much. It was a coincidence. And some examples of statistical tests include t-test, i-squared, and z-test and correlation coefficients and Matthews coefficients, which we'll go into next. So here's some important vocabulary to know. A null hypothesis, so you probably have heard of a hypothesis, but the null hypothesis is a hypothesis that there's no statistically significant difference between your two variables. Um, an alternate hypothesis um, is a hypothesis that one variable does statistically significantly affect another. And p-value is the is a probability value that the results you observed 
happened randomly. Next slide, please. Um, so for example, the student's t-test is a very common uh, statistical test, and it can determine the probability of your result being due to random chance. Use it on numerical data for two categories or sometimes more, and it gives you a decimal value between zero to one. So for example, a p-value of 0 0.5 means that there's a 50% chance that your, that, your, that your observed difference is merely due to chance, but a p-value of 0 0.01 means that there's only a 1% chance that your observed difference was due to random chance. So generally, scientists set the p-value at 0 0.05, so a 5% chance, or a 95% confidence. Um, but you can also see 0 0.01 being used. Um, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, in the, in the image shown, the p-value is, even though the two uh, box plots, they look separated, in fact, the p-value is 0 0.06, which is above the significant threshold of 0 0.05. So in this case, you would reject your alternate hypothesis and accept your null hypothesis, that the two uh, uh, observations are not statistically significantly different. A real brain teaser, a mouth, mouth uh, teaser. Next slide, please. And another popular test is pi-squared. It is usually for genomic data, such as like genotypes as shown in the diagram. And you need a larger sample size for this, generally above 30 or more, and you use it for categorical data, not uh, generally not like, uh, like, yeah, so categorical data. And you're comparing your observations to an expected value. And you'll also use a p-value of 0 0.05. Uh, I'm gonna spend a little more time describing this since it's a little abstract. So for example, um, in a population with malaria, if you have two of the dominant allele, um, you'll have, you don't, you're not affected. If you have one of the recessive allele and one of the um, dominant allele, you are resistant to malaria. And if you have two of the recessive alleles, you'll have a blood disease. So based on mathematics, you'd expect a quarter of the population to have um, two recessive alleles half of the population to have one recessive allele and one dominant allele, and another quarter of the population to have two dominant alleles. Now, if you don't understand how the math works, that's fine. Just know that there's expected mathematical proportions of how common each uh, genotype is. So the purpose of the chi-square test is to determine if um, your observations in the field are statistically different from the expected mathematical proportions. So for example, if you surveyed people for uh, these alleles, and you found that 199%, oh, sorry, that's too extreme. 80% of people have two dominant alleles, 5% of people have one dominant allele and one recessive allele, and another 5%, I can't count, 15% have two recessive alleles. This doesn't match your, your does this, this doesn't match your um, predicted observation that the ratio would be like one to two to one. So you, you but you can't say that for sure just by eyeballing it, because that's not scientific. So you use the chi square test to see if your observations were statistically significantly different than uh, the mathematical or expected values. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. And here is another common, uh, not really a statistical test, but like, like a good visualization. It's most commonly used in computer science for I think machine learning or like recognition type things where you're trying to like detect something. Like for example, in my project classifying cancer where I use this one, detecting cancer where I use this, um, confusion matrix, it is, um, so for example, the reason this is important is because you wanna be able to see numerous different metrics for your model. For example, um, the famous example is, uh, we know that coronavirus affects maybe around 1% of people. So, but, and let's say I wanted to be a sneaky person and say, I've invented a test that can classify coronavirus, that can detect coronavirus at 99% accuracy. That's, that's easy and anyone can do it. Do you know why? Because if one, if one out of every 100 people have the coronavirus and 99 don't, you can just tell your computer model to say that everyone who you enter into the model has no coronavirus. And 99 out of 100 times, you will be correct because um, only um, one, one out of every 100 people. So, so on, on, on the outside, if you only show the sensitivity, which is the true positive rate, this sounds great, 99%. But if you look at the specificity, which is true negative, so how many times did you call something um, negative when it really was? then it'll be like zero. So you really need to show all your metrics to be like an honest scientist because um, it's often very possible in cases where you have more uh, positive training data than negative training data that you can just game the system and 
like major model bias. So by using a confusion matrix, which shows sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, and precision, it gives a much more well-rounded view of the uh, confusion matrix. Generally, these aren't generated by hand. You can use a package called, uh, I think, SKLearn to do this automatically for you. Yeah. Um, next, please. And now is another very common one for um, especially medical applications. And this is an ROC curve, which stands for Receiver Operating Characteristic Curve. Essentially, uh, when you have like a model to predict, for example, whether a patient has a disease, um, you can put different parameters into that model. So on a very basic, probably a little tiny bit um, uh, oversimplified model, let's say you, you'll see your doctor and you want to know if someone has um, asthma. So you, let's say you have two parameters. Um, one parameter is um, how long can this patient hold their breath? And another is what is the size of this person's lungs? I don't think those are actual parameters, but so um, in, in order to build a classification test for this, you want to know how effective your parameters are. So you give a different um, importances or weights to each of the two parameters. For example, you might say, okay, how long they can hold their breath is a lot more important than how large their lungs are. So I'm going to assign it an importance of 100, or but only assign the lung size of importance of 10. So that means that when you're making a decision, the length of breath holding will be a lot um, more important. So the thing is, how do you arrive at these parameters? Because it's not like, especially when you have many variables, like in computer science, like thousands of maybe thousands of variables, it's, it takes too long to test everyone yourself. So um, a computer will automatically test different sets of um, parameters or importance weights and generate this curve. So each point on the curve is actually the results from uh, a certain set of parameters. And how it's displayed is the y-axis is the true positive rate and the um, x-axis is the false positive rate. So an ideal receiver operating characteristic curve, it, it's like, um, I wish I could draw, but it goes oh, it's on it. So it's the blue dot. So if your curve is very close to there, that's perfect. If it's on this, if it's on like the y equals x line, then that is bad. That basically means that um, it's a random guess because 50% 50 of the time you're basically correct. The greater the area under the curve, so how much of the squared part is captured by the curve, the better, the more it is, the better. So yeah. Yeah, sorry for the pixelation and I tried to draw it, but yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. So that was our general overview of a lot of statistical tests um, that you can use. And we thank you very much for coming out this weekend and for your time. Um, our next workshop is going to be next year in January, and we're going to be going over how to write an abstract, how to basically go through screening, and we'll be talking about like all the different parts of your slide deck, um, and we'll know more about how to present for science for this year, so we'll be talking over that too. Um, and now we're going to go into some breakout rooms, we're going to